Welcome back, and now we're going to be talking about completing the square. This is section C2, and completing the square is going to help you with many things, but primarily for what we're working on in section C2, it will be the equation of the circle. But first we need to talk about what completing the square actually means. So I'm going to start with the notion of what is a perfect square in the first place. Let's start with that. So this is section C2, completing the square. What is a perfect square? A perfect square is the result of squaring something. There's a perfect square right there. Perfect square is the result of squaring anything. There's another one. And finally, a perfect square is the result of squaring something. So these are all perfect squares. There's another perfect square. And you really will know that it's a perfect square by doing this. Take its square root. And when you do, you ought to end up with a nice, clean, algebraic result. You shouldn't have a square root in your answer. So again, check. These are all perfect squares. But there are other perfect squares that are a little more interesting than that. And that's when you take a binomial and you perfectly square it. Now, I will tell you, this is one of the biggest pitfalls I see in mathematics. It goes from beginning algebra right up through calculus 3. People are still making the same mistake. So don't make this mistake, please. If you take a look at your binomial squared, it is incredibly tempting to do this, isn't it? It is wrong. So try to avoid doing that, OK? Uh, that is a very common mistake. What does x plus 1 all squared actually mean? It means I want two copies of this binomial x plus 1. And I think you probably know the best way to multiply two binomials like that. And that's going to be your FOIL method. First times first plus outer times outer. Sorry, I didn't do that right. First times first. Sorry, that's the wrong one. <laughs> that's my last. Here's my outer times outer. Outer on the left, outer on the right. That should be my outer. So that's x times 1. Inner times inner is right here. I'll put a little i right there, and I'll circle it. Inner 1 times x. And finally, let's cross that off. That's last. Last on the right, last on the left, and right get multiplied. And that would be L for last. So that's going to be 1 times 1. By the way, 1 times 1 is not 2. I see that a lot, too, believe it or not, because it looks like plus 1 plus 1. People write 2 there all the time. So now the result is x squared plus x plus x plus 1, not 2. Putting it together with your like terms, this checked off, must be a perfect square. In fact, we call this the perfect square trinomial. And the perfect square trinomial is born of the result of squaring a binomial. So this is your very basic initial result. I squared a binomial. I got a trinomial. But it's a very special one. You can write trinomials down that are not perfect squares. So let's do a few of these. Let's do a few more, actually. And I hope that a pattern is established. Let's take x plus 2 squared, which is truly x plus 2 times itself. And if we FOIL this together, we get x squared. We get plus a 2x plus another 2x plus a 2 times 2 is 4. So you get x squared. You get 4x. You get 4. We can check that off. That's a perfect square trinomial. But let's save ourselves some time. There's a much better way to do this. It's a lot quicker. Remember I said before that oftentimes I see students make this mistake. And right up through calculus 2 and 3, people are still making this mistake. So do your best to avoid it. x squared and 2 squared. Basically, it's like you're distributing that exponent in a sense. But look. 
you're missing something right there. We call that the middle term, and you will always miss that if you simply distribute the exponent. So how do we get that middle term quickly and easily? My answer to that is one of each. Take one of these times one of those times one of those. So multiply all three of these together. 2 times 2 times x is 4x. And boy, does that go a lot more quickly than foiling it out. So I encourage you to use the shortcut method. It makes things go a lot quicker, and it also reminds you that you shouldn't just square the first term and square the last term. There's always a middle term. And make sure you get that's a very important term. So now that we know that, let's go ahead and square a few more of these. I want to see this pattern emerge. There's my x squared. There's my 3 squared. And then one of each, 2, 3x, that's 6x. Nice and quick. Let's do another one here. Let's do a minus one. So the first one, x squared, goes there. The next one is the number minus 4 squared. That's plus 16. That's the number minus 4 squared. And then one of each, one of these times one of these times. So that's negative 8x goes right here. Well, if you keep doing this for long enough, you'll notice that an interesting pattern emerges. And the pattern that emerges is that if you take this negative 8 and you chop it in half, you end up with the number negative 4. If you take that negative 4 and you square it, notice that you get 16. And notice that this negative 4 is connected to that negative 4. So that's a pretty good pattern to note. And I'll show you how to take advantage of that pattern to complete the square. So now let's talk about completing the square. Now, we've talked about the fact that trinomials can be perfect squares. I think we call them perfect square trinomials. And the numbers have to match, have to be correct. The pattern has to be right. So here's our first completing the square. Completing the square means fill in the blank. So if I had x squared plus 6x plus blank, what would go there to make that a perfect square trinomial? You can put any number you want in there and make it a trinomial, but there's only one number that makes it a perfect square. Here's the pattern. You take the number in the middle. You chop it in half. We save this 3 for later. We take that 3 and square it and push it up, and that is the number you would like to add. That's a perfect square trinomial. And think about what binomial squared created that. Think about that for a second. Well, if you look back at our pattern, they all had x's. They were all squared. They were all either plus or minus. In this case, this is a positive 3, so I'm going to put a plus right here. In fact, I'm going to use that number that I circled. And that indeed is the binomial that was squared to create that. You can try it by squaring your x, by squaring your 3, and by doing one of each, 2, 3x, that's 6x. So this right here is the action of completing the square. And that's what I'd like you to be able to do successfully. Now, there's two kinds of completing the square. One is just for an expression. So an expression is like what we had there. There was no equal sign. That's not an equation. I'm not asking you to solve for anything. But I am asking you to put the right number in there. Now, an expression, we can add 9 to an expression. I know it's going to be a different expression, but that's, that's kind of all we're going to do. So let's go ahead and do one more of those for an expression. So we'll say completing the square for an expression. So the expression might look like this, x squared minus 16x plus your job is to fill in the blank. So let's do it. The method is to take the middle number, chop it in half, circle it for later, push it to the side, square it, and push it up. And you'll notice that it doesn't matter if it's a positive or negative number. You will always add something to complete the square. And then after you've completed the square, I want to see the binomial squared that caused that trinomial to exist. And there it is. So that's completing the square for an expression. You can literally just add 64. And yes, I realize that changes the expression. But it's not an equation. An equation is special. 
Because if you do something to the left side of the equation, you're under obligation to do the same thing to the right. This was not an equation, so I just added 64 and called it a day. Let's make it an equation and see what might be different about it. What if this equation said x squared minus 16x equals and let's put a good number over here. How about making it equal to um, add 64. So let's put 17 over here and see what happens. Now, honestly, what that is is a quadratic equation that wants to be solved, really wants to be solved. And there's many ways to solve this thing. One way is to move the 17 over and factor and solve it. You're familiar with that. Subtract 17, subtract 17. The other method would be to move the 17 over and use the quadratic formula on it. And here's a new method. The new method is, how about we solve it using completing the square? So x squared minus 16x is equal to 17, but there's plus blank here. There's plus 0 right now. Why don't you add something? So we're going to take the minus 16 and chop it in half and get your minus 8 again. We're going to push this to the side, and we're going to square that. That means to make that a perfect square on the left side, you would add 64. But you just added 64 to the left side of an equation. You're under obligation to add 64 to the right side. Look what I just got. I got a perfect square trinomial that was born of a binomial squared. And it just so happens that it's equal to 81. That's why I was thinking about that 17. I wanted to get a perfect square to make this go a little easier. So this is a perfect application of completing the square because we're about to solve this for x. x minus 8 squared equals 81. What if I were to take the square root of both sides? And of course, when I take the square root of both sides, I would put a plus or minus on one of those sides. Square root cancels with the square. Plus or minus 9. And now if I add 8, add 8. I got my two solutions to my quadratic equation. There they are. One answer is negative 1. The other answer is 17. So it's a nice application of completing the square, and that is to solve a quadratic equation. But notice it was an equation, so I had to do the same to both sides. Okay, So we make sure that we do the same to the left as we do to the right. No equal sign. You can add 64. You don't have to add 64 to the other side since there is no other side. Now, the last thing I want to point out, and this is very important, is that we do not want to complete the square when the leading coefficient, that's the coefficient of x squared, is anything other than 1. So if it's negative 1, if it's 2, if it's 5, don't complete the square yet. You need to do something first. So let me give you a couple of good examples of that. So here's an expression, 2x squared plus 4x. Complete the square, but I can't. I'm not supposed to complete the square when the leading coefficient is 2. Now, you can't just divide by 2 because, I mean, you're altering the original expression. Um, you, you don't want to really do that. You want to maintain the integrity of the original expression. A great way to do that is to just factor out the 2 like this. You'll notice that. It's really the same expression. And now that the 2 is out front here where it's not going to bother us, it looks like I can complete the square in here. So I'll take the 2, chop it in half, and get a 1, circle it. I'll take the 1 over here and square it and push it up. So I'll add 1 here. So I've just completed the square, and the binomial squared that caused that to be was that one. So one method is to certainly factor that number out front. Now, if it's an equation, you can do it a little bit differently. You can do it that way. But with an equation, you do have another way out. Let me show you. So if it were an equation instead, maybe it looked something like this. Not 
2 squared, sorry, 2x squared plus 4x equals 8. Hey, let's try solving this using completing the square. But I can't complete the square because the coefficient is not equal to 1. Now, you could factor the 2 out. I'm OK with that. But why not? Because it's an equation, you have this new permission to do whatever you want to both sides. I would decide to divide both sides by 2. And now you're perfectly within your rights to complete the square and continue the problem. Now, remember, it's an equation. So whatever you do to the left side, you must do to the right side. I'm about to add one to the left. You're under obligation to add one to the right. So what do we got here? x plus 1 all squared is 5. Square root of both sides. One side needs a plus or minus. And look where we are. We're down to x. And there are two answers. So the answer is negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 5. There are two answers, and there they are. So remember, if it's an equation, a great way to get rid of that coefficient is divide both sides by that coefficient. That's certainly a good way to do it. You can still factor out, but there's some complications with that if it's an equation, so be a little careful with that. So that's the end of completing the square. Now we're going to be applying this to the equations of circles. So stay tuned for the next video where we talk about the equation of a circle, how to come up with the equation, and how to graph the circle and the different forms of the equation of the circle.